Greetings, ladies and mendigants, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space. Ah, uh, before we continue, just two quick things. Uh, one, this week is my dad's birthday. Uh, it's the first time in my life that we won't be in the same country or same place uh, on his birthday. So, uh, to make up for that, I would like you all to uh, go into the comments and use the old man emote, just to show him our support. And the second thing... If you are an author and you want me to read your stuff on my channel, whether that be a series or a one-shot, then just pop me a message on Reddit giving me permission, and I'll add you to the list. No guarantees of when and if I will do it, but at least you'll be part of the list of authors I use for these stories. Anyways, on to the story. A Second Chance, written by Farmwitch4275. My subordinates looked carefully at me as I read reports and data slates. They were hopeful, so was I, to be honest, but uh, the more I read along, the more my hope died. I stopped my reading, looking carefully at my countrymen. Their faces wore an expression of friendliness, hope, and piety. They were looking at me for leadership, answers, anything. I didn't have any. Their expressions changed to fit the mood as I simply laid my head in my hands. General Tombuck, normally the most stoic and silent of them all, broke from his honorable vigil by laying his head on his desk and sobbing. Admiral Ulna procured a bottle of wad rot and started drinking. The Secretary of Treasury helped himself to a glass of it before the Master of Agriculture stole the glass and gulped it down before anyone could protest. The scene that played out in front of me was little more than a small-scale version of what was inevitably going to happen across the entire nation. As the room descended into sobbing and madness, I looked over the reports one more time. Crop yields produced barely 30% of what they made last season. We have enough stocks if we ration carefully to last us in next year. Then it's over. At the rate of soil depletion, the next harvest will be the last. Compounding that, the water supply is running low. We have the choice of either watering the crops or feeding the people. We can't do both. Power infrastructure is collapsing with rolling blackouts, meaning that water purifiers and treatment plants can't run long enough to actually do any work. Power generators are now almost out of fuel. We have enough electricity supply to last us maybe a month if, and only if, we shut down everything except the hospitals and water pumps. Rationing is out of control. Entire families are starving on one meal every two days if they are rich or poor. On some occasions, families have been forced to take in orphans because the parents stopped, feeding their kids instead of themselves. No rioting, but that won't last long once supplies are gone. We have six months of food if we only eat once every week, maybe. Then after that, I shook my head, had the implications of continued looking through the data slates. Something, anything, there has to be something we can do. I tried to think of it. I stood from the desk and looked out the window. My face turned to even greater despair when I saw the dead grass, its blue coloration replaced by brown and red. The trees were slowly dying out, even at the height of spring. No flowers, no leaves, just browns and greys. I returned to my seat and went right back to despair. I tried to think. The men in front of me began to throw fisticuffs and insults. Blame began to be thrown about and tempers fled. Just then, one of the soldiers marched in, highly irregular, but he was agitated. His large eyes were more expressive than usual. He burst in the room and immediately charged towards me, ignoring the usual necessary bows and salutes. He slammed his hands on the table, shaking me from my concentrated despair. Then, in the loudest voice he could muster, he yelled, Millions! Everyone suddenly stopped what they were doing and looked at him, bewildered. He slammed a set of papers on the table. They were a series of images. At first, it was grainy. I could only make out various dots and shapes. The next image showed that they were getting closer. I could see jagged edges, smooth contours, and good approximate sizes. The next image revealed details like insignias and armor plating, cannons, weapons, the soft glow of a shield. I looked up at him. These pictures were taken by the old courier probe that was launched ten years ago. They just passed by Kordos. The Colonial Observatory can see them. 
I looked at the final picture in the set. There were thousands of them. All of them were heavily armed, very heavily armed. One of them could take on entire platoons worth of men, and there were thousands. Oh, gods, what now? What do we do? As if things weren't bad enough. Admiral Alter said, now focusing less on strangling General Faltax. What is the ETA? How long do we have to prepare? Field Commander Relin asked, taking a look at pictures. We have ten minutes before they reach orbit. Uh, probably less, the soldier said. Strange insignia. Brown and green coloration. What a very odd military force. I can see they are heavily armed, but the color scheme seems strange, the Secretary of Agriculture said. That's your concern. The paint job. Look at the size of those cannons. Shut up, I yelled out. The group quickly scrambled back to their seats. I waited until they were all quiet and at full attention. I don't care if the crops fail. I don't care if the waters are worthless. This is my planet, my home, and I will defend it to my last breath. If our last moments on this ball of rock are dying to a hail of plasma fire, then so be it. Ready our defenses! The leaders of our nations gathered their intellect and strength faster than I could imagine and began planning defenses. And sure enough, Within a few minutes, panic gripped the world as confirmation appeared above the skies. Within hours, we were underground and secure bunkers in command centers, civilians in their basements saying the last goodbyes and soldiers had mustered to arms. I sat around a board table with the other leaders, and we were exchanging ideas as reports started coming in. Any news? Have they landed yet? Several reports of units landing in the polar regions, Scouts report that some ships are walkers, hexapod in design with their large heads. We can't tell if they are armed or not. They look similar to the survey craft, Admiral Saronis said. The larger craft appear to be fully-fledged starships. One has landed in the ocean and has started doing uh, something. Uh, the other five craft have remained in orbit. We have had 600 or so of those hexapod machines and 200 quadrupedal machines starting landing across the planet now. We have reports from the Katani and Gadanti empires too, the Secretary of Defense said next, pointing at locations on the planet's surface. This makes no sense, I said, looking carefully at the intel. This makes no sense from a military standpoint. See? They are forming this strange hexagonal pattern, 200 kilometers apart from each other. What are they doing? Perhaps the military strategy is not needed. Look, they are heavily shielded and look at the guns on that one. They don't need tactics when they have that kind of overwhelming force. Admiral Saronis pointed out several pictures of the more complicated looking machines. I, I'm... That may be the case, but look, uh, what is this? I can see three distinct classes of machines. What are they doing? The smaller one seems to be doing some kind of a uh, defense unit. The middle-sized one appears to be drilling unit of some kind. The larger ones don't move from that position and, uh... What is that thing on its top? Uh, some kind of emitter array? They, they don't look military to me. I asked, pointing out the various anomalies. We are getting some kind of interference in our radio communications. They are definitely interfering with our comms, so, uh... That is a military action. This signal is, uh, strange, though. It's a series of shorts and long beeps and nothing else. We can filter it out and communicate, but still. The secretary I spoke next, turning his radio filter off so that we could listen. This does not make any sense. They've been here for two hours now. Why haven't they attacked? And what is that ship in the ocean doing? My fleet just told me that it went into the trash vortex of the Cranian Ocean. It looks like it's, uh, consuming garbage, Admiral Saronis said, as he brought up a short video of the ship using its bulk to vacuum up the garbage. We have, uh, reports of more starships entering the system, followed by more of those walkers, thousands. They will be in orbit within a few hours, but... They are still more of the same. Smaller armed craft escorting medium-sized drilling units, sir. The larger hexapods seem to have either limited or no weaponry. If this is an invasion, it's uh, a bad invasion. The Secretary of Defense pointed out some inconsistencies. 
Like I said, overwhelming force. They don't need tactics when you have this kind of tech. With this kind of power, maybe it is piss poor strategy, but uh, do you think they need to care? Admiral Serona spoke up, getting sideways glances from the others. Outside, it was a mixture of order and chaos. Civilians running around trying to secure their families, while soldiers carefully shepherded them around to try and avoid chaos. The few vehicles that we had still in operation were buzzing around as carefully as possible, so that we could save what little fuel that we had left. The fact the machines were large enough to be seen in the distance was not helping calm everyone down. The machines themselves, apart from the clunking and screeching as they stomped over the ground, were randomly emitting strange electronic screeching noises and loud squeals that echoed over the desert for hundreds of kilometers. The sounds of rocket engines and starship thrusters also rocked the atmosphere, creating even greater panic. Something isn't right here, I spoke over the noise of the command station. Why? Why is their logo a cartoon tree? I pointed towards a close-up photo of the large machine that was closest to us. Prominently on its sides of the head of the machine was a picture that looked like a circle surrounding a cartoon tree. Getting new reports, sir. New machines have landed. They are dropping in close to cities. The lights flickered and the ground shook as we felt a mass of machines land above us followed by the muffled screams of those who witnessed it and immediately began panicking. We started hearing the desperate clang of gunfire as panicked citizens and soldiers started to open fire. Reports began flooding in on the machines being hit by our weapons and our guns doing nothing, not even scratching the paint. The few vehicles we had began to fire the few shells that we had in stock, only for the shells to disintegrate harmlessly against the machine's shields. I stood up from my seat and walked to the door. Sir, what in the red sky are you doing? My commander yelled it as he tried to stop me. Those are my people, I yelled out and startled my fellows. A moment of shock silence followed. Look around you. Now food supplies will run out completely within the next year. Our water supply is contaminated to such an extent that we don't have a future anyway. And look at this shit. Look at it. The planet is already dead. We already know it. Everyone hung their heads in sorrow and shame. Our entire future now consists of a few wealthy and powerful individuals hoarding the last remaining resources and hiding in bunkers until eventually the gene pool gets thin enough to sterilize them or supplies run out, if not to get eaten by the few desperate people that still remain. I refuse to be a part of that world. I was elected to serve this nation. I dedicated my entire damned life to service. If this world is to die, then I swear I will die with it. I shoved my subordinates aside and walked out the door. I walked with my head held high through the steel-reinforced corridor where eventually I encountered my people. Mothers and crying children huddled in corners and against the walls, cowering from the clanging noises and gunfire. The few men who were too starved or weakened to fight were with them, holding their families. I smiled my best smile at them as I walked by. Hold your fire! I said, hold your fire, damn it! The sergeant on duty yelled through his comms, trying to rally his men and stop the panic. Some men ignored him and continued meaninglessly expend ammunition that we didn't have. He grabbed several panicked soldiers and belted them one right across the face, yanking their weapons away and sitting them down, trying to calm them. I saw it firsthand. He was just standing there staring at us. Massive beasts of heavy metal, the size of twenty-story buildings, six bulbous legs with a massive claw for feet that dug into the ground. Mounted on top, almost like a crab, was a huge head with spiky protrusions jutting from it, a combination of both antenna and heavy armor plating. The plating looked arranged just so, giving the machines a sort of face with two large red streaks serving as its eyes. I stared it down, opening my arms and screaming out, Do your worst! Do you hear me, machine? We have endured greater threats than you! We shall always endure! You do your damned worst! I got a cheer of support and enthusiasm from my advisors, followed by all of us readying our weapons for a final firefight. The machine moved, tilting its head down and forward, directly looking at me. It spoke in perfect Iridian, its voice echoing across the area for miles. As you wish. 
Its visage changed to a bright green and its light began to emit massive amounts of energy. I closed my eyes, and others followed my lead, and we prepared for the end. It never came. Planetary recalibration preparation in progress. Each machine across the planet spoke in perfect unison, their voices echoing across countless miles, empty, toxic oceans, and open deserts. I stood silent and still, as if I were expecting death to haul me away into oblivion. Nothing happened. Toxic filtration system activated. Carbon refraction system activated. Charging main release vector. I opened one eye sheepishly, cheating the death I'd apparently been promised. The only thing I saw was a giant machine being swallowed by a mass of green and blue energy particles. Genetic cloning operation ready. Wildlife receding system operational. What? Cloning? Wildlife receding toxic filtration? What were these machines doing? My arms grew tired and fell to my side. I looked around me. Most had given up as I did and were simply looking around to see what the blazes was going on. Planetary recalibration preparation complete. Everyone was dumbstruck, unable to respond and just stood there, having heard the machines echoing words and lack of gunfire. Families and children filtered out from the bunkers and stood to watch. System active. The energy collected and blasted upwards into the skies like a pillar of light leading to the heavens. The entire planet was instantly blanketed in a shield of green and blue as the energy dispersed. Atmospheric pressure shielding at maximum, refracting gravitational field complete. For a split second, we felt a little lighter, then a little heavier, then normal again. Recalibration procedure commenced. T-31 to completion. Stand by. The world around us began to shift and change. The area immediately surrounding the machine withered away what little life was left in the ground and the static shock of some kind. Then a bubble of green and blue energy began to radiate around it. As the bubble contacted the ground, life instantly appeared. The all-familiar blue grass of our planet, grass I had not seen in over a decade, began to grow in furious force as months of growth took place in mere seconds. The trees in the surrounding forest regained their purple-hued leaves and brown-gray trunks, the entire horizon suddenly disappearing behind a forest of beautiful foliage in nature. The dirt and sand under our feet vanished in a thick carpet of grass. Any spot that had exposed soil of any kind or quality now had patches of flowers or thick carpets of grass saturating its every available surface. It was at this moment... I captured the most beautiful sunset that I had ever seen. The mountains superimposed in the background, a freshly fallen blanket of snow topping the peak, with the first storm cloud seen in over ten years, now slowly closing in on the horizon. The sunlight now of purple and gold shining through the tree branches, saturating the world in a beautiful soft glow, a mixture of gold and purple. The storm clouds over the horizon gathered ever closer, and the thunderous rumble of approaching rain could be heard above the noise of the machines. Rain. I looked around me and saw children with fear in their eyes. Most of them had never seen rain or a storm, so were now clutching their parents' hands tightly, clinging to them for safety. The sunlight vanished, and the darkness kept at bay by only a soft light of the machine's energy. A wave of celebration and elation overcame us all as the first drops of rain felt in ten years began to hit the ground. As if overcome by a strange force, all of us began to dance in the rain. Brailing arms and tapping feet began to join the chorus of fresh water falling from the sky, bathing both us and the ground in life-giving water. We forgot ourselves for the next few hours and simply danced away the night until we got too wet or too tired and retreated to our bunkers or homes to sleep. While we were asleep, the machines continued their work. In the morning, I awoke and walked outside. Barely moments later, I heard a sound that I hadn't heard in 40 years, a loud territorial shriek of the shallow tail squall. I looked, and indeed, there it was, its long angular peep waving at me as it flapped its leathery wings defensively. The machine still stood in silence nearby, 
its energy fields dissipated. Now the only thing heard was the quiet hum of nature's beautiful sounds. Noises I thought I would never again hear filled my mind. And for the first time in as long as I can remember, I took a deep, long breath of the freshest, sweetest air that I've ever had. Slowly, as other people woke up and joined me, I walked around. And for the first time in forever, I took my shoes off and felt the beautiful softness of the blue grass under my feet. A few hours past morning, the machine startled all of us as it began moving again. It stomped its way through the ground and looked straight at us. Its voice boomed through the beautiful skies and everyone everywhere could hear it for miles. Even those underground could still hear it. We are humanity. You are not alone anymore. Listen and listen well. The terraforming procedure we just completed are nothing more than a measure to buy you time. This planet's biosphere is too unstable. It will die eventually, want it or not. Focus your efforts now on getting into space and colonizing other worlds. You have been supplied with fuel, tech, equipment, and enough food to give you a chance that we never had. Do not waste it. We will be waiting for you. The machines began to lift themselves into the air and off the planet, and within minutes, we were alone again. I took a long, deep breath one more time as we waved our saviors goodbye. The chaos began anew as commanders and officers began barking orders and securing supplies left by the human machines. Hydrogen engines, wind turbine blueprints, water filtration units, and hydrofusion reactors. It was all up to us at this point. Tech we could only dream of was at our fingertips. We are coming, humanity, and we owe you a beer. End of story. I would just like to thank our T5 members, Lord Azrakal, Ambrose Cattell, Quantum Wednesday, Dregzoon WRE, Blueberry Cat, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Bushmaster 177, and Leslie 517. Thank you very much.